friends. Come in, have a seat, and, and here's what you should really do, is instead of just having a seat, you should have a seat near the front, because, of course, exciting stuff is going to happen, and we don't want you to miss it. So, come find a seat. We'll take a little time to find a seat. Um, find, find a, if you're already seated, you should find a friend next to you, and you should, you should compliment them on a piece of their outfit. We're making great strides forward here. Those of you who are in the back, we would encourage you to come and find a seat. Armand, that means you. Welcome, friends, to our first of the year 2013 Friday Night Live. <laughs> to kick it off this evening, we are going to be hearing from a cover band of Mumford and Sons. So give us two seconds while we're in. Let's give them a hand, everyone. to find any truth in your lies And now my heart stumbles on things I don't know My weakness I feel I must finally show Lend me your hand and we'll conquer them all But lend me your heart and I'll just let you fall I can change what you see but your soul you must keep totally free
direct your attention to the back. Our resume pin. You see, with the resume pin, you can clip up to 14 sheets of resume paper onto your shirt. And that way, no one will forget who you are or what you've done. As well, it has that sleek, professional look that employers are looking for. <laughs> but I'm afraid that won't fit everything. Uh, well, if, if you need more sheets of paper than the 14, might I suggest a nerd level resume pin? <laughs> which, which can fit up to 72 sheets of resume paper. Ooh. Oh, but no, it's, it's not the 14 sheets isn't enough. You could use all the paper in the world and you would still be missing the biggest part of me. Well, if it's religion you're looking for, uh, might I suggest our line of lapel pins? You see, we have a variety of crucifixes or crescent moons or stars of David or laughing Buddhas or pentacles or really whatever you are personally interested in. Or for the especially religious, might I suggest bumper stickers or t-shirts? <laughs> no, it's, it's not religion. It's relationship. Oh. You see, having a boyfriend is a big part of what defines me. And your boyfriend would not fit on the resume pin. Probably not. <laughs> well, in that case, might I direct your attention to the jumbo identity box? You see, between, between the jumbo identity box, you can fit all of those knickknacks and persons of interest in your life into the box. Um, that, that is assuming you have very few people in your life, but in your case, I think we're in luck. <laughs> I'm sold. But the, there's just one thing. Um, yes, and, and what might that be? 
I don't have a boyfriend yet. Oh. <laughs> well, not to worry, my dear. You see, we have a, a wide selection for you to choose from. <laughs> Any of them? Yes, indeed. Hmm, well, let's see. <laughs> Great wardrobe. <laughs> I love your hair. Mm, not likely. <laughs> well, but you see, this one has, has a, a strong broad chin. Very, very firm, excellent. And, and this gentleman here has a wonderful personality. Please, <laughs> 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 man. Am I allowed to get closer? Oh, in fact, I encourage it. But don't rush to any hasty decisions. <laughs> Um, usually. Um, in fact, some of them we find quite hard to shut up. <laughs> I'll tell you what, why don't you, you sit down and have a conversation and see how the, um, the chemistry flows. Why don't you watch a Friday Night Live with them? Oh, I'm a little nervous. Well, don't, don't be, my dear. Uh, tell you what, why don't I go and sit down with you and we'll, we'll start from there. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. 
But you say you'll replace it, I'll take it. owns me. No one owns me. If you asked me who's in charge, I'd say me only. I do as I please. I determine my own deeds. I supply my own needs. Concede? No, I won't. Conform? No, I wouldn't. Throw your hands up at me. I'm an independent woman. I won't be tied down, you see. I'm in control. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. Do you believe me? Yeah, I didn't think so. Because <laughs> I don't believe me either, if you wanted to know. Because there's this need in my soul to devote my whole life to a person or a purpose or a cause or the creator. But it had better be good. Better yet, it had better be true. So now I'll pose the question. Who owns you? Don't talk to me. You say I'm absolutely free. No drugs or alcohol, but just school. Work on the daily. Got one thing on my mind. I head down. I'm on the grind. My nose to the grindstone. Yeah, I burn the midnight oil, but so? I'm totally in control. I'll study hard for days, so I'll keep on making A's. I've got confidence and spades in my smart remarks. And hey, someday I'll get a job if I keep on working hard. Have a white fence in the yard and a good man on my arm. What are you doing? Stop distracting me. I've got no time to dream. Got my studying regime. I'm on a schedule of notes and books and reading. And now I'm stressed. This talking gives me less time for tomorrow's test. So lock the door behind you and tell my friends that find you that I changed to my binder and my desk and my computer monitor. Wait, so who owns you? There ain't nobody that's owning me. I'm just somebody's property. Yeah, I've got friends that I know love me. Yeah, I've got too many to name, really. But you can't condemn popularity. Sorry that people 
are so jealous of me, but I can't help it that I'm popular. If you'll find nobody that's hating me, I'm known for my adaptability. I can be just who you want to be to be. To be very honest, I people please. And it takes its toll and consumes my soul. But where does it start in the real me? Stop and how do I sustain the real me? continuous outpours, and incurably so. We are hardwired with a strong desire to give ourselves away in praise to an individual or an ideal, and it's quite an ordeal. So who owns you? I said, who owns you? Do you think it's safe to judge your actions without asking the judge of heaven and earth his opinion? I mean, if it sounds good, and it feels right and must taste right and be righteous, right? Wrong. I mean, hey, you can go on believing in whatever, but it'll wither before long. You see, Jesus is the only solid rock, and you'll be rocked if you're standing on sin's sinking sand. Let me offer you a new plan. Belong to Jesus. Hmm. But I'm an American, a free man, a slave to no man, Slavery's been done for years. But I'm being sincere. When I ask you, do you believe it? Take a look at an alcoholic. Controlled by a hangover and enslaved to his emotions. Ensnared by Jack and Jim and the captain. He's not the captain of his own soul. His joy comes from a bottle and depletes along with its contents. Or what about the girl who refuses to eat because she doesn't meet the standard of beauty expected by the street vendor's magazine cover. Her life is undercover, and she lies to her mother as she lies on the bathroom floor after losing her lunch. Tricked by the times and manipulated by the media, she's not the master of her own fate. Choosing your own shackles makes you no less enslaved, so who owns you? Stop tap dancing around the subject. Stop marching to the beat of your own drum and come to Jesus, for his followers are friends and free from their sins. Jesus is where striving cease, where identity is complete. So be completely his and let go completely of what this world has to offer because no one can serve two masters. Again, 
I'll ask you. Who owns you? Can we give one more hand to our performers here? So who owns you? I hope that that question makes you uncomfortable because it makes me uncomfortable because I don't want to be owned. You know, I'm, I'm free, I'm an American, gosh darn it. You know, and, and we in America, we know all about freedom. And I say that to myself and then I'm like, okay, good, so what exactly is freedom? And when I think of freedom, I think of this time when I was like seven years old and my friend Peter Hergrove and I, we built a chariot. Um, we, were, we were seven, give us a break. Um, so, so we built this chariot and it was one of those little red pole wheelbarrows. Did anybody, show of hands, did anybody have one of those little pole wheelbarrows? Yes, you know what I'm talking about. Those things were awesome. So, so we had a pole wheelbarrow and we had a plastic chair. And we were like wheels plus chair equals chariot. Here's what we do, we stick the plastic chair I told you I was seven, don't judge. We stick the plastic chair on top of the little red wheelbarrow, boom, chariot, go. We were the coolest seven-year-olds on the block. And, and so there was, um, there, there, was, there, was a, there was a woman there with us um, who, was, who was watching us. You could say she was babysitting us, but she was neither of our mothers, so we didn't feel a strong sense of attachment to this woman. And um, so when she said, guys, stop it, we were like, you know, We've got a genius thing with the chariot here, and you are not going to interrupt it, old woman. <laughs> so, so we rode in the chariot, and I should tell you, Peter, I don't know how Peter ended up being the workhorse, um, but I, I thought I had a good deal, um, because I was riding the chariot. And so I rode the chariot, and I rode the chariot down the hall, and I rode the chariot around the corner, and I rode the chariot off the chariot. <laughs> And I rode the chariot right through Peter's older brother's floor-to-ceiling window. And then I stopped riding the chariot at the part where I went to the hospital. And it was less pretty down the line. See, here's the thing. So I had freedom, right? I rode that chariot. But in, in, in the freedom of riding the chariot, I gave up another freedom, which was the freedom of keeping my head entirely in one piece. If you know me and you've been wondering what's going on, maybe this explains a few things for you. <laughs> you can tell me about it later. See, so freedom then is always an exchange. We're always giving up one freedom in order to get a new freedom. One of the political theorists um, whose ideas they borrowed when, um, when they founded America, his name was John Locke. Um, and he said this, where there is no law, there is no freedom. Where there is no law, there is no freedom. Because Locke believed when people stop being in bondage to the law, people are going to start being in bondage to each other. And so unlike some of his contemporary philosophers who said, yeah, you know, whatever you want to do, you should just go ahead and do it. Um, and by the way, some of his contemporary philosophers are the ones who inspired the French Revolution. Um, Locke said, look, we've got to follow rules. We've got to be serving something. Another author, um, his name's Rabindranath Tagore, and he's from Bangladesh. Rabindranath Tagore, say that five times fast. Don't try it. <laughs> it'll, it'll damage you permanently. Um, Rabindranath Tagore, he said it like this. Emancipation from the bondage of the soil is no freedom for the tree. I love that one. Emancipation from the bondage of the soil is no freedom for the tree. Why? Because the tree was made to be in the soil. Because the only way that that tree can be free, can do what it was supposed to do, is to be in the soil. And so the tree, like all of us, has an exchange. Do you want the freedom? of being alive, 
Or do you want the freedom of being out of the soil and being dead? And some of you are thinking, boy, I'm so glad I'm not a tree right now. But you get the idea. If you want the freedom of beautiful music, then you're in bondage to the rules of harmony. If you want the freedom of getting wasted on Friday night, then you're going to be in bondage to your Saturday morning hangover. If you want the freedom of flying, then you're in bondage to wings. And so the question is, what do you want to be free from? And what are you going to let own you? See, we're all on this hunt to figure out who we really are, where we belong in this picture. We're, we're looking for an identity, something that we can stick on the, on the resume pin of our lives. Um, and the minute we start to put our identity in something, we start to make that thing our master. It's like Mumford and Sons said, where you invest your love, where you pour your time, your money, your energy, your affections, where you invest your love, there you invest your life. And I think we all have some different predispositions as to what thing it is that we try to put our identity in, what thing it is that we walk up to and say, hey, please own me. Um, and and, and for, for those of you who know me, um, you know that generally the, the thing that I have the most problem with, the thing that I most often over my lifetime um, have done that with is trying to be smart. And you're thinking, no, really, you look totally cool up there. Like, I had you with the cool kids. <laughs> sure. Thank you, thank you. I'll be here all week. Comedy routine. So, so I, I, won't, I won't give you my resume. Um, and, and I won't, I won't, well, I won't tell you about pulling weekly all-nighters, I will. In college, I used to pull an all-nighter every week, Wednesday night, I scheduled them, um, because there was no way to get all my homework done unless I had weekly all-nighters on Wednesdays uh, for several semesters. <laughs> and it was fabulous in its own way, um, and it, it dominated my life. I mean, if, if, you, if you knew me, then you would feel like, well... What does is, what is Greg care about? You could look at my life and know, ah, that's what he cares about. That's the thing that he walked up to and said, I'm going to be in bondage to you. That's the freedom I chose, and that is the service that I chose. One of my friends in college, she once came to me, um, and she said, okay, Greg, situation question. And I was like, I'm ready to bring it. And, and she was like, situation, you have a big final exam starting in five minutes, and one of your friends needs to be driven to the emergency room. What do you do? And I thought about it, and then I said, does this person have any other friends with cars? <laughs> and she was like, Greg, how could you? And I was like, look, it's just, it's just an honest way. You know, it makes perfect sense. Like, if somebody else has a car, then somebody else should probably. <clears throat> and looking back on it, I was pretty ashamed that that was my gut reaction. My gut reaction was not, oh my gosh, let, let's get this person to the hospital. My gut reaction was, hey, folks, I have a test in five minutes. And I was totally free from the responsibility of saving my friend's life because I was totally in bondage to that final exam. And so I sympathize very much um, with one of the lines um, from that awesome spoken word that Elise shared um, that goes like this, and I'm not going to say it with the cool rhythm, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> Head down, I'm on the grind, nose to the grindstone. Yeah, I burn the midnight oil, but so? I'm totally in control. I'll study hard for days, so I keep on making A's. I've got confidence in spades, in my smart remarks. And hey, someday I'll get a job if I keep on working hard, have a white fence in the yard, and a good man on my arm. <laughs> okay, so at the end there, maybe not a perfect parallel, but it gets, it gets the gist. And, and I, I tried a couple, a couple other things, too, over the years. I had a, I had a brief tryst with sports, which went really poorly. <laughs> really poorly. I fled sports after that. Um, I invested a lot of my life into writing, into becoming what I hoped was a good writer. Um, and I invested a lot of my life in trying to make myself likable, in being what people wanted me to be. It got to the point where when somebody asked me, hey, do you like this book? Hey, did you enjoy that movie? I, I wouldn't actually have an opinion of my own because I was so used to parroting back 
everybody else's opinions to saying you hated that movie, so did I. Yeah, and then I would try to remember when somebody asked me, like, was this the person I said I hated it, or was this the person I said, you know, there were some really redeeming qualities in there. And I, I, needed, I needed, like, a list. I needed to know which persona I was using for which person. And, and I don't know what it is for you that you tend to invest your love and your life into. Um, maybe, maybe it's not academics. I hope it's not sports for your sake. Um, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's body image, um, or, or sex, or alcohol, or drugs, or drag racing. I don't know. I don't know you. Um, if any drag racers here, I don't want to hear about it. Um, but I had this search for identity that kept leaving me hollow. That kept promising to make me feel like, ah, I've gotten there. In this thing, I am free. And I was never quite free. Again, it's like Elise said, choosing your shackles makes you no less enslaved. I had chosen all of those things. I had gotten to a place where I said, I am free, I can do what I want, and then I would just walk up to something new and say, hey, please enslave me. Please, I mean, really, let me just hand you my life. Again and again. And I could tell that I was made for more than that. I could tell that I wasn't really supposed to be stuck in these things. I was made, again, as Mumford & Sons says, made to meet my maker. In the Gospel of John, the, the story of, one of the stories of when Jesus came to earth and hung out with us, there's a story where Jesus meets this woman at a well. Um, and it was, it was kind of scandalous because she was a woman and she was a foreigner. And for both of those reasons, Jesus shouldn't really have been talking to her. Um, but he did because Jesus was awesome like that. And Jesus broke some pretty sweet rules. And, and this woman had a big problem with relationships. Um, she, she, was kind of, she was kind of what you might call like a, like a relationship junkie, I guess. So she, she'd been married five times, um, which is a lot, I hope. Um, <laughs> I hope. She'd been married five times, and she was, she was with her sixth guy now. She was working on him. And, and she was free to have as many husbands as she wanted. That was the freedom that she chose. But she also chose the bondage of never actually having dependable love. Because she just, she went through these husbands like they were tissues, and she never had something to last. And she picked this identity, but it owned her without really satisfying her. And so Jesus went to her, um, and he said, I can satisfy you. He said, they, were at, they were at a well, and he said, I can give you water that will make you never thirst again. This thing that you keep walking up to things and saying, hey, own me. I can fill that thing. I can own you in a way that will make you free. And, and so Jesus says, stop, stop trying to earn love. You know, stop trying to do all these things to get to where you want to be. Um, I can do all of this for you. But there's a catch. And that's that you need to bind yourself to me. Oh. Imagine, imagine that this is me over here before, before I knew a thing about Jesus. Well, I was still stuck like this woman in some sin. And, and for me, again, it's not having too many husbands. That's not one of my problems. Uh, but let's go with it, okay? Um, uh, too many wives, too many wives. So here, so here I am over here, and I, I'm having too many wives. Um, and if I, if I break free from that, and I get to this kind of neutral middle ground, and I say, okay, I'm gloriously free, now what do I do? My tendency is always going to be to slide right back to where I was. Why? Because I'm always looking for something to own me. And Jesus says, if you really want to come out, then you can't just move from there to here. You can't just move from bondage to nowhere. But you have to stop being owned by that and start being owned by me. And it's a message that if I were Jesus' publicist, I would have said, you know, can you tone it down a little bit, Jesus? Like, yeah, people want to be free, but people don't want to be owned by you. So, so we, need to, we need to frame this a little better. Um, we need a marketing plan for you. And Jesus was not really interested 
in a marketing plan. Jesus said, I'm here to tell the truth. It's the truth that's going to set you free. It's not what you want to hear, but it's the truth. And the truth is, you need to be bound to me. In the book of Romans, Paul says that you have a choice. You can either be a slave to sin, or you can be a slave to righteousness. And he says, I'm using words with you that I know you'll understand. I know that you understand what it is to be a slave. But he said, you don't have the right word to describe what it's like to be stuck in righteousness. Because righteousness is the place that you want to stuck. Because being stuck in righteousness is awesome. Because everything else that owned you was miserable. And that's why when I hear the phrase, who owns you, I go, blah, I hope nobody. But to be owned by righteousness, to be owned by Jesus Christ, is the best thing in the world. It's like, it's like light and darkness. You know, I can't say, hey, I want to be free from darkness, but I don't like light. Get me out of this darkness. But no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in, in this light thing you're talking about. I don't, I don't want to be in bondage to that. There is no choice here. There is no middle ground. Choose darkness and be in bondage to that. Or choose light and be in bondage to that. And one of them will leave you forever feeling empty. And one of them will leave you satisfied. There's a story of a guy named Elijah, who was a beast of a guy. He like called down fire and things. And, um, and at the end of his life, instead of dying, he got taken up to heaven in a chariot, which is sweet. Speaking of chariots. <laughs> <laughs> and this one time, Elijah, Elijah was with a whole bunch of people, people who had claimed to follow God, but were following all these other things instead. And Elijah said to them, choose this day who you will serve. Don't keep on pretending to serve two different things. Or don't keep on pretending to serve nobody at all. Choose this day who you will serve. And I think today we need to choose who we're going to serve. We need to, to pick something. And Jesus says, I want to own you. I have everything you need. Just, just come to me. And if you want to know more about what that means, about what it means to be owned by Jesus Christ, then please come and talk to me. Come at, go and talk to the person who invited you here tonight. Um, talk, talk to Elise. Talk, talk to anybody. We would love to talk with you. But don't let tonight go by without choosing who's going to own you. Don't leave this room and say, I'm going to get free from those things that used to own me, but I'm not going to be owned by anything new. Choose tonight who's going to own you. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you that you came to own us, God. Not just to set us free from the things that used to keep us in bondage, but to make us your servants, God. To own us because we belong in you, because it's only planted in you that we can really live. God, I pray that you would move in every heart here tonight. God, that we would be drawn into you as we're drawn to the light and away from the darkness. God, I pray that we would feel a need to be owned by you. Mm -hmm. We invite you in and we ask you to own us. And it's in your powerful and precious name that we pray. Amen. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here tonight. I am now going to invite up Matt Booz, who is going to talk us through the end of the evening. So please give him an enormous hand. Thanks, Greg. As Greg said, my name is Matt. I'm the president of University Christian Fellowship that um, just hosted this Friday Night Live. That's the conclusion of the event. So um, when you came in, you should have received a small yellow card and a pencil. And um, we're going to have the AV guys play some music in the background, and now's the time for you to fill that out. Um, Ian, who's standing in the back there, has some extras if somehow we missed you when you came in. Yeah. <laughs>
choose which of the four they want. Okay, so here are the four. Um, Emily Brown, can you raise your hand? All right, Emily Brown is going to knit a scarf. That's one option, knit you a scarf. The second option is um, the four people who planned this event, the production team. Could you guys raise your hands? There are you. The second option is to go on a sledding trip with these three or four. Um, <laughs> Sounds like fun. The third option is cookies that Eric Bellows baked. They're back there. They're like cookie brownie things. They look pretty awesome. And the fourth option is to get a free music lesson with Elise. How long is it going to be? An hour. All right, an hour. Maybe an hour and ten if you're nice to her. All right, first name. Sorry, I signed you up for that. <laughs> Oliver Henning. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All 
All right, which prize do you choose? <laughs> yeah, cookies? All right, yeah, thank you. Excellent choice. No lessons. <laughs> Aaron Strack. Aaron. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Which prize would you like? Um, I'll take the scarf, I guess. Awesome. Nice. Cool. All right. That concludes the Friday Night Live. Thank you all for coming out. This was great. <laughs> In two weeks from now, there'll be another one at Potsdam, I believe. Potsdam. Potsdam. Two. Sorry, baseball. You can see it from farther away. Um, and there's going to be snacks and other refreshments in the back because it's very hot in here. So socialize, meet someone new, have fun. You're all dismissed. <laughs>